Hey everybody, it's Charlie. This is going to be my full Black Panther review. Hopefully you've had a chance to see the movie. We're going to be getting into specifics. Probably one of the best Marvel movies that they've ever made, not without its flaws. And from what I've seen, most people are in agreement on what those flaws are. And amidst like these really amazing performances from amazing actors and all these really mind-blowing visuals, it's really the conventions of superhero movies that drag down certain parts of the film. If you're just finding me for the first time, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. We have so much Infinity War stuff that's going to be happening now. There's a weekly giveaway that I'm doing that I'll talk about at the end of the video too. So careful for spoilers if you have not seen Black Panther. I'll wait just a second. So here we go. Starting with the really cool stuff. A little bit James Bond, a little bit Shakespeare. Hamlet in my opinion. But the James Bond stuff was really funny because he feels a lot like James Bond, the way that they write the character, but they also literally reference James Bond during the film, those funny American films that Father used to watch so much. The reason why this is key from a story standpoint, and also for future Black Panther movies, is it makes him a jet setter. He can go anywhere. What is one of the conventions of a James Bond film is you literally travel all over the world to different places in the different movies. So it just opens up a world of storytelling that you wouldn't get before. The way that that can become a problem for films like Spider-Man, who's mostly central to New York City. So the other beauty of Black Panther, too, is that it's literally set in a location that you've never been to before in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So there's like a whole half of the globe that they can travel all over that you wouldn't see in the normal Marvel films, who are mostly American characters or the films that are set in outer space. Really, the James Gunn in the Marvel Cosmic Universe is doing the same thing to broaden the Marvel mythology in the way that Black Panther is. Just a whole different location that you mostly didn't see for those first 10 years, even in the Thor films, which take place in outer space. Kevin Feige even said that they pumped extra money over what they would normally pump into a movie to build the world of Wakanda, to just like give you its full majesty. And I feel like that translates well. Black Panther's line is very key. This never gets old. So of course, Chadwick Boseman is fantastic as Black Panther. He plays King Black Panther amazingly. The story of him ascending to the throne, the Prince to King storyline, does fall prey to some superhero movie conventions, so that pulls the film down a little bit, because it asks you to make a couple leaps, like, oh, well, let's pretend that he's dead. We know that he's going to be alive. That and the fact that the character just doesn't have a lot of natural flaws. Like I said, he plays King Black Panther perfectly. He has this very regal way of holding himself, even when he's not sure of himself. Like, he doubts himself through the film. But through it all, he seems like this unstoppable force. There is no point in the film where you believe like he is not going to be victorious. So I've seen a couple of hilarious complaints, even from people that love the film that say we want to see a Black Panther with a few more flaws. But it's just it's really hard to accomplish that when you need someone to be a king on the level that he is. So I can understand why people have some problems with that aspect of the character. But it's not like Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark. You can't make Black Panther as a character as despicable as Tony Stark was during the first Iron Man film. There's so much that we can say about Michael B. Jordan's character. Also falls prey to a couple superhero conventions, but by about halfway through the film, when he gets to see his father in the Dejalia and you have that cry moment, that's what brings it all together. That is the most important part of the film for his character. Because up to that point, he just feels like a standard Marvel villain or something out of a Spike Lee movie with a little bit of Shakespeare thrown in. But a lot of the credit towards crystallizing his character also goes to that child actor that played the young version of Killmonger and his father, played by Sterling K. Brown. They really brought that scene together. So by the end of the film, when they're sitting there and he's sort of bleeding out, you really feel for his character the way that you felt for the Loki character. In the way that they wrote, what happened to his father. Like, his backstory is key. And yes, they did change the comics to do that, but because it totally worked, I was totally fine with it. Usually in retrospect, like when they change something, it's cool as long as it works in the moment. The secret weapon of the movie, both figuratively and literally, is the Shuri character, the little sister that makes fun of her big brother, who just happens to be the most powerful king on the earth, in this amazing tech genius with a sense for style and pop culture that enables her to crack wise like Iron Man or Spider-Man would. Like you can actually see each of them just trying to outquip each other in a conversation. Oh, actually he's the boss. I just pay for everything and design everything and make everyone look cooler. Lupita, Denai, both amazing characters. I'm a little bummed about how good Lupita was in the movie because now it's like, well, they're very clearly setting her up as the love interest for Black Panther. How are they going to work Storm in when they get the X-Men characters? 
Martin Freeman is an amazing actor who feels a little odd in the film, like he's just meant to be the connection to the wider world. He literally works for the CIA, now he's going to become something of a liaison to Black Panther because he's opening up the borders and giving everybody access to their technology. So while the movie writes him to be a very important character, it just feels like he doesn't rise to the level of some of the other characters in the film. So amazing actor in a slightly underwritten part. But Andy Serkis, obviously great as the misdirect villain, he does a great job of being despicable. Like, that's his role in the film. Be the villain that only cares about selling to the highest bidder, doesn't care about culture, doesn't care about history, whereas on the opposite end of that spectrum, all Eric Killmonger cares about is his history and his heritage. Kind of a bummer to see him go out, but I did like the way that they retroactively explained that Age of Ultron scene where he explains how he got the brand. It goes all the way back to Killmonger's father. If that wasn't clear, all the vibranium that Killmonger had stolen from Wakanda when we get to Age of Ultron was actually done so with the help of Killmonger's father. That's why King T'Chaka came to talk to him in that opening credits scene because Killmonger's father was trying to use Claw to arm all the oppressed people all over the world the way that they tried to do later in the film in a much more militaristic way. I would say Winston Dukes and Baku never quite rises to the level of Killmonger or Nakia and Okoye as characters. He falls prey to a lot of superhero conventions where it's like, okay, we understand he's just supposed to be an obstacle for Black Panther to overcome on his way to the throne. He becomes a lot more fun in that final act of the film, but he's barely a character. Love the Spike Lee movie within the movie, all the Oakland stuff. Like, that's how they try to tie it into a more real-world setting. Like, look, this is how Black Panther, as a character, can affect these people that are living in America. But I think a lot of people wanted them to focus more on that. Like, what does this actually mean for the people that we see running around in all these Marvel movies? So they wanted it to be more political, but because it's a Marvel movie, it needs to be more of a superhero movie. So I can understand why different people want different things from the movie. But it does a really good job of trying to address real world issues and then explaining what Black Panther is going to be doing about that going forward in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I saw that a lot of people were down on that opening narration explaining what Vibranium was. That's what that was for, just to explain why it was so important, how it got to Earth, because it's a big MacGuffin of the film in a very big deal for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But if you've never read a Marvel comic book, just trying to explain what Vibranium is and how it can be used in all these different aspects of life, how it's not just a metal can be a little dense, so I was totally fine with that opening narration scene. You even see Captain America's plane when they're talking about all the world history that's happened, like they do the World War II scenes. The Kendrick soundtrack was next level. That's probably going to be the other biggest thing that people talk about after the film. I've been looking for vinyl pre-orders, but I haven't seen any pop up yet. The only other minor complaint about the film is that final big CG battle that he gets into with Killmonger. It's weird that at this point in Marvel history, they haven't got to the point where they can really do a CG battle like that in a convincing way. Like, it still looks a little cartoonish at moments when they both are in full costume fighting inside the Great Mound. But again, all Marvel complaints, I feel like they don't ruin the film at all. And I do, I love the hilarious complaint about Black Panther's character, that he's too perfect, which I think is a, a very understandable thing, like I explained. Like, he has to be king. You can't make him as despicable as Tony Stark was before he became the character that he is now. So once you have a chance to see it, everybody, let me know what you thought of it in the comments below. Obviously, there's all kinds of stuff that we can talk about for the Black Panther sequels. There's no way that they're not going to do a sequel during Phase 4. The only thing that we know about films past 2020 is, is that we might get X-Men characters. So all bets are off after 2020. But we have Captain Marvel, we have Infinity War, Avengers 4. So just leave all your bonus video requests in the comments below. But obviously, most of my videos after the next couple of weeks will be focusing more on Avengers-related stuff, on Captain Marvel, and the stuff going forward. There is supposed to be a new Infinity War promo later tonight, so obviously I'll do a video for that, but that'll probably be posting late. As long as you have alerts enabled, you will see the video, so make sure you click that bell if you haven't already. But congratulations to the latest giveaway winner, Mr. Rogers. Please private message me so I can get your contact details. It's for the Infinity Gauntlet, but if you want movie tickets, that's fine too. I mean, it's basically the same value. There'll be a new round of the giveaway when I post new Marvel later tonight. So while you wait for everything, click here for my Black Panther post credit scene video and click here to rewatch that Infinity War trailer. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I'll see you guys tonight.